I'm a biological oceanographer. And you might think this is not quite your regular nine to five job, and you might be correct. It comprises of countless hours in the laboratory, then some more in the, on the microscope, and an occasional field work on the ocean, on the sea. I took this photo in the middle of the Atlantic in 2018 during the two-week research cruise. Nice, huh? Well, concerning that, I would like to share, or rather confess, one of my biggest failures. I am a biological oceanographer that does not put her head beneath the surface of the ocean. <laughs> I do not jump in. I don't dive. I basically swim like a dog. And I do this because I'm scared of my head being surrounded by a weird medium that feels very constricting. And Yes, I have tried facing this fear many times. Um, I even went on a diving course, um, all <laughs> ready to conquer this fear. And long story short, it ended with me punching the diving instructor um, in the face while he was trying to calm me down and then spearheading to the safety of the surface. And I never went down again. You might say I failed. And I try to tell this as a charming story, but I do have a lot of negative emotions connected to it, much like giving a presentation on TED in front of you guys, knowing that I will fail. And I know we all fail attempts, and we all have this negative emotions that we try to ignore, and I would like to talk about one fa big failure that we all have in common together as humanity, all of us. Well, we have few, <laughs> but you might suspect the one that I'm going to talk about, the climate change. And we all know what it is and what it is doing and if you still think that you don't know, I invite you to watch the news. Or, and while you watch the news, you might come to agree with me that this is not longer, or rather, this is not only climate change, but rather a climate, climate crisis. And by climate crisis, I mean uh, the crisis of our lifestyle. I say this because the earth will bounce back one way or the other. We are, I'm not that sure. And this is because the earth has in place numerous mechanisms to fight, to fight the climate change. And uh, the most important one is the ocean. Uh, our global ocean covers 70, more than 70% of the Earth's surface. And it has a very high heat capacity. Uh, in recent decades, uh, it absorbed as much as 90% of the global warming. And basically, the top few meters of the ocean store as much heat as the entire Earth's atmosphere that stretches from the surface to 10,000 kilometers, kilometers above us. And this comes as a cost. It increases the ocean's internal heat and causes the melting of the ice sheets. It causes rising sea levels due to heat expansion coral bleaching. Um, it causes in the intensification of hurricanes, changes in ocean health and biogeochemistry. 
And we might as well say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, ocean, because absorbing 90% of the global warming is quite a service, especially as it comes at such a high cost. And this is not all. Ocean, apart from absorbing all this heat, also absorbs the carbon dioxide. And this is the same heat-trapping greenhouse gas that is causing this uh, global warming. And the carbon dioxide in the ocean becomes part of the oceanic carbon cycle. And this is a series of processes, the so-called pumps, that exchange carbon from various pools within the uh, ocean and also the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth's interior and the sea, uh, sea bottom. And the ocean has three of them. The solubility pump, the biological pump, and the carbonate pump. So the solubility pump dissolves the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the ocean, which is then transferred throughout the ocean by ocean currents and vertical mixing. And this dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean becomes, um, it's the part of the largest carbon pool on the earth. It's just the, the, a big storage space. And the second one, the biological pump, it uses up this dissolved organic carbon and transforms it into the organic matter. This is done in the process called photosynthesis, which is performed by the grass of the ocean, um, the phytoplankton. And it, this is the, how the carbon is fixed even further into the ocean's atmosphere. No, sorry, <laughs> interior. And the third pump uh, is done by uh, marine organisms, such as plankton or mollusks, that form hard shells from calcium carbonate, which make their bodies more, more heavy. And uh, this way, they, when they die, they sink more efficiently to the bottom of the sea. So we have three pumps. The solubility pump that dissolves the organic carbon into the, uh, the ocean, the biological one that fixes the carbon, and then the carbonate one that sinks it more uh, efficiently. And they all work together uh, uh, to cut off the carbon from the atmosphere and bury it down for thousands of years or even longer. And in the ocean, the carbonate pump and the biological pump are done by tiny planktonic organisms, uh, the phytoplankton. And in my everyday job as a biological oceanographer, I study one such group, uh, the coccolithophores. Uh, the word in uh, Greek means stone-bearing cells. So, as you can see on this photo, this is the cell that is covered by calcium carbonate plates, and each species has very distinct and intricate uh, shapes of this carbonate plates. And these are some from the Adriatic Ocean, or sea. And not only are coccolithophores difficult to pronounce, they are also um, impossible to see with the naked eye. In, on average, their diameter is five, 10 micrometers, and this is five times smaller than the diameter of your hair. And this is why I had to use electron microscope to take these photos. And basically, this, I have it here, a 3D printed model of a coccolithophore, 
And if you guys in the last row cannot see it, well, that's kind of the point. And there is this one species of <laughs> coccolithophores called Emiliania huxley, or E. hux for short, that is found in almost all oceans. Uh, it goes, it inhabits ecosystems from the equator to the polar regions, from nutrient-rich coastal waters to ocean, uh, to nutrient deserts of open ocean. And it is found in a liter of uh, sampled water anywhere in the surface of the world's oceans. And it's not only omnipresent, it also forms very huge blooms that stretch hundreds of square kilometers and that are visible from space, much like this one on this satellite image of a barren sea. And the, this bloom is defined by the turquoise color that comes from the light being scattered on their calcium carbonate plates. And we call it a bloom when there is at least 10 million of these cells in a liter of water. And that's 10 million in one liter. So by sheer quantity, this Emiliania Huxley, e -hux, uh, impacts enormously the oceanic carbon cycle and also the Earth's climate. It fixes the carbon, it buries it down, and basically it is a reason that we currently do not live in a hot house. And I wanted to talk about it because it's kind of a model of you thinking that you cannot do anything to fight the climate change. And this tiny creature, or millions of it, has already done it, and it's doing it right now. So look at this sunset over the Atlantic. You might have an urge to ask me, Jelena, what can I do as, as my share of the problem to fix it? And I would essentially say you can do two things. You could reduce consumption and you, sh you can go out and vote. And the consumption thing, it's pretty clear. You have to be aware of your needs and then consume <laughs> appropriately. We need that people that govern us to be aware that govern our collective resources, to be aware that, that this is a crisis and that they demonstrate that they're able and willing and that they want to act on this crisis. And with this, I will leave you with the message, reduce less and vote. Because going back to the negative emotions that we all don't want to face, that paralyze our actions. In the realm of the climate change, no one is too small to act. Thank you.